Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be able to speak about the research that I've been doing for the last 20 to 25 years. I've been focusing on uh, glycosemic control in obese individuals and those with type 2 diabetes. And what um, I have really looked at is how does diet and ex exercise uh, modify glycemic control and um, what is the, the hormonal and metabolic responses that we see. More recently, what I have focused on is does exercise timing matter? And this has um, been looking at more of the timing during the day of when people exercise. Should it be before or after a meal? Should it be um, looking at the circadian rhythm of what's going on in the body with various hormones? And it probably doesn't make that much difference in mean individuals, but it probably does in individuals who have type two diabetes. So we are um, really interested in this because as you know, as people get more and more obese, that we see more individuals that um, have um, either high blood sugar levels, they have diabetes, um, we see hyperinsulinemia with these individuals, we're starting to see more fatty liver disease as well as other metabolic diseases. But our biggest complications come from the hyperglycemia when we get these high spikes and also um, the delay in recovering back down to normal levels. And this really creates problems where we start getting vascular inju injury and problems with endothelial metabolism. So let me tell you a little bit about um, the blood glucose response to a meal. Um, when we have uh, something to eat and it's got carbohydrate in it, we see an increase and then we see it return back down to normal. And usually by 90 to 120 minutes in a healthy lean individual, it'll return back down to where it should be. In an obese individual with insulin resistance, we see this rise, but what happens is, is one, it could take longer to peak, but two, it stays elevated for a prolonged period of time so that when we get out to this 120 minutes, it's still well above the resting level. And so now you have more circulating glucose in the system. When we um, then ask the question, what happens when you have a second meal? So let's say the second meal came at two hours. So you ate breakfast, now it's 10 o'clock and you have a snack. What happens to your glucose levels? Well, of course it's going to go up again. And what we know so far is that glucose levels at the second meal, sometimes it's a little bit higher, but sometimes they can actually be lower because we get what is called the first meal effect where the first meal we see the high glucose, it's like you're priming the system and it does a better job on the second meal. But what we really don't know is what, where should we exercise relative to this? Should exercise be before the meal in the fasted state or should exercise be after the meal? And then what we see here is that this may help bring the glucose levels down when, when exercise is here. So this is um, a kind of a line of research that might've started maybe a little longer than 15 years ago, but there's not a lot of research in this area, but what there is there is start, starting to show us some trends. We also know that there are circadian rhythms in how our glucose and insulin works. As we know with many other uh, bodily functions that the glucose levels are um, can change with the time of day. But what we also see, this is like sleep. It's like when we see certain hormones like cortisol or melatonin increase. So there is definitely circadian rhythm, rhythms that can come into play with this. So when we look at the um, individuals with um, that, that don't have type two diabetes and we look across a 24 hour day, you can see that the glucose levels decrease throughout the day because the subject is fasted and then they stay low for the rest of the day. And maybe they creep up a little bit starting the next morning, but they're really not elevated all that much. And when we look at the insulin level, insulin follows the same pattern and it stays low through the night when the glucose levels are low. When we look at the type two diabetic individual, they start with a much higher glucose level. They drop pretty dramatically and they stay low. But then what happens is somewhere around 10 o'clock at night or, or some point, we start seeing a rise in the glucose levels. So then these individuals wake up with a high blood glucose level. But when we look at their insulin, there seems to be an asynchrony with this, that instead of mirroring it, as we see in the lean individual, what we see is insulin levels just kind of fluctuate a little bit during the day, but there's no real circadian pattern to it anymore. We also know that the glucose response to a meal follows a time of day effect. So um, Van Cotter in 92 very nicely showed that if you have the same meal in the morning 
and repeat the meal again in the evening, that you're going to get a greater glucose response, suggesting you're a little more insulin resistant in the evening than you are in the morning. So this may make a big difference when we're looking at individuals who have insulin resistance, um, that just the time of day of when they eat their meals and what the composition of the meal is. So the, probably the first study that really came out was in 2001, um, asking the question, is it more effective to exercise fasted or after breakfast? And in this study, what they did is they had um, type two diabetic individuals come in on two occasions and they exercised at moderate intensity for uh, two hours after they had their meal. And as you can see here, if they exercise fasted, glucose levels uh, really didn't change all that much with the exercise. But if they exercise uh, after the meal and, or two hours after breakfast, you can see that the glucose levels really responded to that exercise and decreased and then stayed lower for a period of time after the exercise, after the exercise bout. You can also ask the question, um, is, is it better to do all our exercise first thing in the morning or should we be spreading it out throughout the day, which gives us better glycemic control? So this was a question that we asked as part of Michael Holmstrup's um, dissertation when he was in my lab years ago. And what we did in this study was we had subjects come in and they were there for a 12 hour period. And on the first, on one occasion um, was their sedentary day where every two hours we would feed them something to drink. And so that their caloric intake was pretty much balanced to the number of calories they burned uh, sitting around the lab all day. We then, uh, had another study day where we still fed them the same amount of calories throughout the day, but we did one hour of walking first thing in the morning, and then they sat the rest of the day. And then we had another occasion where they came in and we had them walk for five minutes every hour. We still fed them the, the, the glucose drink and we um, looked to see what their glucose and insulin. So this was just a little bit of walking and the amount of exercise they did every five minutes matched the hour of walking they did first thing in the morning. So we studied 11 obese women with insulin resistance. And this is what we saw. If we follow the pink line, you can see that if you exercise with all your exercise going first thing in the morning, that you kind of blunt the rise in glucose levels and it kind of stayed low for the next two hours. And then when we gave them the next meal, you can see you start getting the rise in glucose levels. What was interesting to see was that Compared to the intermittent exercise, which we got slightly, maybe slightly higher rise in the first meal, but at subsequent meals, our glucose levels tended to um, stay a little lower than compared to when they did exercise first thing in the morning. So there seemed to be in this some benefit of the exercise that was every five minutes throughout the day. And if we look at this as area under the curve, you can see that the intermittent exercise was significantly lower than the one bout of exercise first thing in the morning. Interestingly, what happened is even the sedentary day seemed to be better than that. I'm not surely sure why, why that occurred. Um, but, but it did show that this getting up and moving really helps with our glycemic control. So we've had additional questions that we wanted to ask is that, is it more effective to exercise before or after dinner? And you're probably thinking, well, what difference does that make? But actually it does make a difference because breakfast is preceded by an overnight fast. We know that breakfast will show a first meal effect because the liver pretty much hasn't been primed. And, um, and the bulk of our research has looked at morning testing. And where this really may be most important is in a clinical population. It may not be as important when we look at the, um, the, the, popu the other population when we look at everyone else. So the first study that was done looking at that was, was by Kohlberg and in 2009, she had a group of type two diabetic subjects and, and she tested them around the dinner meal and she asked them to walk for 20 minutes at a self-selective pace um, to see uh, which is more effective at lowering glucose levels. And what you can see here is that when they did no exercise at all, you had the meal and you got the slight increase, but really not a big change in glucose levels until you were a couple hours after the meal. But when you looked at the individuals who exercised um, before the meal, you can see their glucose levels kind of rise and stay kind of elevated through much of the time. 
especially in comparison to when they did post-exercise. So if they ate their meal right here, what you saw during exercise was a decrease in the glucose levels and then they stayed lower. So this was our first hint that possibly at around the dinner meal, exercising after dinner may be more beneficial. So my doctoral student, Tim Heaton, uh, followed up with this and he asked the question, is post-meal better exercise better than pre-meal exercise and does the exercise type make a difference? So what he did was we did something similar is we had a, um, a, a dinner meal right here. They either came in and exercised beforehand or they exercised after the meal and we had them do resistance exercise. So this was not a self-selected pace, but it was a very distinct exercise bout. And if you look at the black line, you can see the glucose response to, to the meal. And if they exercise before the meal, you can see that the exercise did decrease the glucose level slightly. But in response to the meal, there wasn't really a big difference between the two, so maybe slightly lower. But if you looked at when the exercise followed the meal, you can see a very distinct decrease in the glucose levels in response to that exercise and stayed a little bit lower for uh, the next, you know, um, maybe uh, 30 to 60 minutes. If we look at this as area under the curve, you can see that the two exercise bouts both were better than doing no exercise, but the exercise after the meal tended to be a little bit lower, but was not significant in this case. What we do, did see, however, was when we looked at triglycerides, that the exercise post-meal really helped keep the triglyceride levels lower and kept them lower over the next four hour period. And so if, if we look at area under the curve, you can see now it's significantly, they're significantly improved when exercise followed the meal versus when exercise was before the meal. And they're both better off than the no exercise condition. So really um, between the data that has been out there has shown that um, if exercise is done after the meal and we're looking at the breakfast meal, the bulk of the literature has shown that you get a better effect on glucose levels to exercise after breakfast versus before breakfast. That's not to say there aren't some studies saying that was better, but the bulk of it shows um, post-meal is better. And we saw the same phenomena occurring when we looked at the dinner meal. And what was even more interesting is we saw not only the glucose's uh, levels being benefited, but also the triglyceride levels. So this brings to me the thought of, of you know, as we look at this kind of issues tied to social justice, one, one concern that, that I have and, and typically see is that we don't really um, translate well to get our findings out into the field. And unfortunately, this really doesn't help the people that we're really trying to help as we figure out this literature. We need to be translating our findings out to the community and helping those people who may not be getting in and getting the medical coverage that they can. There is a lot of information that we can get out to people to now say, maybe you should be timing your exercise. If you can get your exercise in regularly, maybe you should be timing it. Um, we also need to be doing better at considering whether people have time to exercise. People with lower incomes may be working more than one job. They may not have access to facilities because of cost or distance. People may not have safe places to walk. But as we know that as we look at this obesity problems and it does hit, um, different populations um, more so than others with obesity and type two diabetes, we really should be working, I think, to get our findings out there, especially on diet and exercise, because there's many things that people can do that really may not cost them all that much money, but may help them tremendously. And thank you very much. <laughs>